Schindler's List revolutionized not just cinema, but the world. Through Spielberg's lens, we gained access into one of the most horrible moments in history by recounting the story of Oskar Schindler, a German factory owner who saved the lives of 1,000 to 100 Jewish prisoners during the Holocaust. A visual representation of accounts we'd only learnt about in books and stories, where our brains could never fully comprehend anything close to the level of terror that happened. But because Schindler's List is such a strong and haunting reminder of humanity's dark potential, I'll be the first to admit, it's a hard movie to watch. It feels real. You're not just watching an artificial story about the Holocaust that interrupts the suffering with levity. It doesn't gracefully turn the camera away as people are slaughtered. It shows it all in the most authentic ways possible. It's so difficult to watch that before revisiting Schindler's List to make this video, I had only seen it once. That one time also doubled as my first exposure to the depravity of the Holocaust. I was 11 years old. My family and I were driving to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. To prepare me for what we would see, my dad stuck me in the back seat of the van away from my nine-year-old brother and gave me a pair of headphones and a portable DVD player ready with Schindler's List for me to watch as we drove. He told me not to play the audio out loud because he didn't want to hear it. It made him too sad. Growing up, I forgot most of the film's storyline. I couldn't recall anything outside of the general overview and this empty feeling inside me that stayed long after the screen went black. I've attempted to rewatch the film almost every year since then, but consistently change my mind at the last second to avoid that emptiness. Recently, I was invited to the Director Project playlist by Cult Popture, a fellow group of YouTube video essayists. The Director Project is a playlist where, once a month, a group of video essayists come together to analyze the work of one director. When he told me we were focusing on Spielberg for the first one, I knew I needed to revisit the movie I'd been selfishly avoiding. Upon re-watching Schindler's List and doing some research, I learned that Spielberg achieved this level of realism through taking a cinema verite approach. Cinema verite, or cinema of truth, is a form of filmmaking where the aim is to observe a scene as it unfolds as opposed to communicating any specific message or theme through style. This approach started in documentaries appearing in films like Grey Gardens and The War Room, but has since been adapted for scripted content like The Office or What We Do in the Shadows. The filmmaker, and to an extent, the audience, is a fly on the wall in the scene. For Schindler's List, as Spielberg puts it, Most of my movies, the camera is a character. But in this story, in this recreation, which I think is more of a document, a remembrance than an actual motion picture production, I wanted the camera to sort of be invisible. And to do that, I took what I call a news camera approach in, in, in filming some of the scenes like the liquidation of the ghetto, the health action at Prashoff. Many, many scenes were handheld. The result is an unflinching look at the Holocaust that feels as though we are experiencing the terror through the camera of someone who's documenting real events and reacting as such. Given that Spielberg used cinema verite as the defining style of the film, there is one scene in particular that intrigued me, and that is the introduction of Oscar Schindler. In this scene, we first see a dapper but shadowy figure that we later learn to be Schindler, surrounded by money and symbols of wealth. This then cuts to the same figure walking into an SS dining hall as an unknown guest. Through the sequence, we see Schindler go from a mysterious observer to the life of the party, quickly making connections throughout the Nazi ranks by way of his charm and extravagance. In comparison to the extreme and horrifying nature of the rest of the film, this sequence is almost forgettable. But what captivated me about it was that you can feel a distinct and palpable style. The direction isn't silent, but rather screaming. The choice to constantly obscure Schindler's face with light, camera angles, hands, and smoke. Liam Neeson's deliberate movements, the carefully orchestrated focus pulls, camera pans, and tilts. Altogether, it's reminiscent of a beautiful waltz, which is appropriate because waltz music plays throughout the scene. As my friend Joe Cherovino from the Overrated Podcast puts it, begins in a kind of classic, almost like a noir, Casablanca, rich Hollywood cinematography. But then as the scene goes on, begins to kind of get peppered with the documentary style that you'll see throughout the rest of the film, with the presence of the photographer girl who start taking photographs of well-to-do in the restaurant. And it's very interesting how that's contrasted with the dramatic eye light that they give Liam Neeson when he's analyzing the scene and looking about how he's going to manipulate the ambiance that is around him. He went on to note that this old Hollywood style appears throughout the film in reference to Schindler. But I extend that argument to say it's most obvious here. But why? 
Why would Spielberg, who was so committed to creating a semi-archival piece, make such a bold exception for this one moment that isn't even the first two scenes in the film? There is something indescribably mysterious about this character. It was impossible to really understand why he did what he did. But we decided just to let the audience work that out for themselves. Instead of showing us objective reality, what she does through most of the movie, I think Spielberg shows us Schindler's manufactured reality and how he sees the world. As a delicate dance he's choreographing, he's constantly watching for entry points to see where his next move should be. Through this perspective, we not only get to see his character, but his alignment in a film where he all too easily slips between two dissonant groups. Everything he says, every move he makes, is purposeful and a way of manipulating and angling to get what he wants. How are you doing? You leave a woman alone at a table in a place like this? Lovely fragrance, you're breaking my heart. An extra chair, please. Vodka for my friend. For the lady? No, no. Schindler isn't part of the real world. He lives in his own. A feature that's even more apparent when you also consider that he's the only person introduced in isolation with a strong focus on his possessions. For me, this scene is a typical example of a technique Spielberg likes to employ called point of thought. In this technique, the camera is used to visually communicate what a character is thinking, feeling, or perceiving. For Schindler, his point of thought is illustrated with the floating camera and strategic close-ups to details relating to his ultimate plan. By including this point of thought sequence, Spielberg primes us with the information that Schindler is for Schindler, tainting almost every interaction he has for a majority of the film, or at least the first third. It acts as an upfront reminder that he's not a Nazi at heart or a Jewish sympathizer. He's looking out for his own interest and constantly crafting intricate and fluid plans to fill his own needs. When he cozied up to the main SS officer, it wasn't for friendship, but to gain influence in a system he was playing. He chose Itzhak Stern, a prominent Jewish businessman, to collaborate with, not because he wanted an opportunity to help the Jewish people, but because he wanted cheap labor and threateningly reminded Itzhak about the Jewish people's situation to bring him on his team, as hinted by the train whistle that plays during Schindler's last line in their first meeting. I'm sure I don't know anybody who'll be interested in this. Well, they should be, Itzhak Stern. Tell them they should be. We never get to observe who he is behind the smiles and morbid thoughts. His sleek introduction gives us insight into his motivations away from his biased interactions. You know, he, he manipulated all the different factions and brought them all together to serve him. He was in the Oscar Schindler business after all. And it's very important to remember that because Schindler knew exactly what he was doing at the beginning of the war. I truly believe at the beginning of the war he was only interested in one person, himself. It's an especially useful reminder in situations where Schindler out loud says his intentions to make money. It's hard to believe that the protagonist of our story is prioritizing wealth over the plight of the people he employs and seems to be protecting. His foreword provides continual context that he is in fact sincere about wanting to gain wealth. He's just a German who wants money. He's not anti-Semitic or violent. He sees all people as equals. They're just potential avenues to get rich. Even more so during this time of turmoil, as Schindler states, And it makes all the difference in the world between success and failure. Whoa. However, just as Spielberg uses point of thought to demonstrate the depths of Schindler's selfishness, he includes this technique two more times through the film to show the disintegration of this worldview established in Schindler's stylistic introduction. The second point of thought in the film happens an hour in, when Schindler observes a little girl wandering around the Krakow ghetto as the Jewish people are being murdered and rounded up to be sent to forced labor camps. Of all the carnage that's happening, he can't take his eyes off this little girl meandering down the street. He couldn't take his eyes off and wonder why she not been taken along with everybody else. And of course the answer was, well, she will be taken. May not be in the next few minutes, but she, she's not going to survive. This scene may be filmed in a cinema verite slash point of view style, but what makes this a distinct point of thought is the use of color in what is largely a black and white film. Despite the chaos, we focus on what Schindler focuses on, the girl in the red coat. This is also the first time in the film that Schindler glimpses into what life is like for Jewish people and what the Nazis are really doing. He's not hearing about a man with one arm being shot. He's not walking past a cattle car of people going to an anonymous location. 
He's witnessing firsthand the treatment of people in his care, and in that moment makes a connection with a figure symbolizing the innocence trapped in the brutality. He is briefly exposed to the real world. This is built on by the third and final time Spielberg shows us Schindler's point of thought. When Schindler sees the decomposing corpse of the girl in the red coat being wheeled towards a mass grave of burning bodies. At that point, you can see a complete break from that Schindler first mentality established in the beginning of the film. His expression goes from apathy to genuine concern and shock. This is the second time Schindler is exposed to the sheer carnage of what has been happening under his nose as he continued to profit off the Jewish workers. This emotional shift is reflective of the viewer's journey while watching the film. Through the movie, Spielberg allows us, the audience, to follow certain faces from the start to the end of the Nazi reign. With these connections, we're given moments of relief in what is otherwise a bleak experience by seeing these people continue to survive their struggles. Much like Schindler with his factory workers, he almost felt a sense of duty by bringing in people to work for him, saving them from the threat of murder in the work camps. Despite his protests, he knew what his factory was. His place is a haven, didn't you know? It's not a factory. It's not an enterprise of any kind. It's a haven for rabbis and orphans and people with no skills whatsoever. But the girl in the red coat represented that nameless face in the crowd Schindler and us, the audience, have been neglecting. Every time we feel happy that someone we know survived, we're forgetting the millions of others that didn't. This is when Schindler completely abandons his pursuit of wealth and self-fulfillment that has loomed over every previous scene. This is when he makes his list. It was the final point in his transformation. This simple scene showed the power of facing difficult truths and dismantling intricate and deeply rooted selfish delusion. Understanding how these milestone point of thought scenes played together to showcase Schindler's character arc makes Schindler's final moments of the movie much more tragic. In the end, after the people he saved give him a ring engraved with Whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Schindler loses the composure he's maintained through the film and laments I didn't do enough. There will be generations because of what you did. As Schindler stands among the 1,100 people he delivered from slaughter, the audience is meant to think that Stern is right. Schindler did what he could. He gave everything away. But if you consider that opening scene that tainted all interactions going forward in the film, you see that Schindler is right. He could have done more. After seeing the destruction of the Krakow ghetto, he made several attempts to lessen the suffering he became aware of by trying to set good examples for SS officers and bringing in more workers to his factory. But he had the power to do more. To me, Schindler's cries of guilt weren't about making the list longer. He knew he could have done more because throughout the entire war, he actively didn't do enough. He could have taken action earlier and potentially saved more of the people in that mass grave. He could have saved the little girl in the red coat, but he didn't. Schindler knew murder was wrong and he wasn't anti-Semitic, but he cared too much about his own well-being to do anything to spark substantial change. That is, until he was faced with the atrocities perpetrated by a system he was complacent to and benefiting from. In a way, many of us now embody his mentality. That's why it's so painful to watch Schindler's List. Most people, I hope, know it's wrong to discriminate. We know the Holocaust was evil. We feel we wouldn't be that little girl on the street shouting, Our sense of moral superiority makes it easy to shy away from exposing ourselves to media like Schindler's List, Hotel Rwanda, or the limited series When They See Us about the Central Park Five. We already get the moral. We've already heard the story. We don't need to expose ourselves to reality outside of what we consider comfortable in our distorted bubbles. This mentality extends to how many of us approach injustices that are happening today. We think that since we're not racist or sexist, we don't need to actively do or say or learn anything that would take us outside of those bubbles because we already have the moral high ground above people who support separating migrant children from their parents indefinitely and keeping them in cages. And while we might think we're better, for the most part, we're Schindler in the opening of the film. Now, I'm not saying we're obligated to turn our lives 180 degrees and do what Schindler did by the end of our movies but we can at least try to amplify marginalized voices and advocate for people who are silenced in the system we live in. 
Only by educating ourselves and confronting difficult truths can we shift our own points of thought and start to affect any meaningful change in our world. Because you don't want to wake up one day realizing you could have done more, but you are too involved in your own waltz. And those are my thoughts on Schindler's List. If you want to watch more videos dissecting other Spielberg properties, be sure to check out the Director Project playlist where other video essayists analyze their favorite features in his catalog. The link to the playlist is in the description below and the cards of this video. And if you also want to contribute to the Spielberg Director Project, make a video talking about your favorite Spielberg movie. Then tweet it to at Cult Popsher and he'll add it to the playlist. I'd also like to give a shout out to my friend Joe Cherovino from the Overrated Movie Podcast for his quote. I'll also be including a link to his podcast in the description of the video. At this point, I'd like to thank my patrons Matt David, Patrick, Jessica Lee, and Eric Brown. Thank you to you guys and everyone else who contributes for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.